Our next guest needs no introduction, but I'll give you one, bossies. You've seen her designs on multiple celebrities, from Selena Gomez, Gigi Hadid, JLo, to even the Princess of Greece. Her designs are sold by over 100 of the world's most prestigious retailers, including but not limited to Selfridges, Bergdorf Goodman, Netta Porte. Bossies, you get the idea. Welcome to the show, Olivia van Halle. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I feel rather embarrassed starting off with that. <laughs> no, don't be. We are so excited to actually have you on the show today. Your story is truly inspiring. And like many of us, oh. we only see the massive success, right? We see the established international brand, the end result kind of. But take us back a little bit. Where are you from and did you always grow up around fashion? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm from Kent, which is like a countryside outside of London. Um, I now have lived in London for about 10 years. I think I always had a real connection to fashion and I always felt very sort of passionate about it but I grew up on a farm and my mother hates shopping like with a passion like still now I have to frog march her once a year to go and buy new clothes and as a result I was very trapped in this rural kind of on this rural farm and the only access I had really to clothes was the fancy dress box that we had which was full of my mother's got three sisters and it was old dresses with ridiculous poofy sleeves and then it had my grandmother's dress that she had made herself in the 50s and 60s and then it even had one of my grandmother's flapper dresses from the 1920s in it like be heavily beaded flapper dress it was beautiful so my only connection to fashion were the vintage clothes I had in this box so this um this uh, fancy dress box it was a beautiful trunk and it uh, my mother has four sisters so it had this kind of amazing collection of uh, dresses through the ages going from my grandmother my great grandmother's beautiful flapper dress a sort of heavily beaded drop waisted number from the 1920s through some amazing dresses that my grandmother had made herself in the 50s and 60s and then my aunt sort of puff sleeved you know sort of ball gowns and like prom dress style dresses um from the 1980s which sounds all rather glamorous and amazing and in some ways it it was <laughs> but in other ways I was a 14 year old teenager who wanted to look just like all of my friends and actually having to go to my first ever school disco in 1995 when everyone else was wearing vest tops and little satin skirts and looking like they were in the Spice Girls and I was wearing <laughs> my aunt's <laughs> snakeskin puffball skirt uh, cocktail dress from the 1980s. It, it, it was fairly ghastly. I, I didn't have any other option and it forced me to be quite fearless with what I wore because it was either wear that or your school uniform or your jodhpurs. The, there was no other option. <laughs> Hey. So yes, it was that was my sort of introduction to fashion. And I think as I got older, um, I started buying Vogue when I was like, a, you know, kind of 16, 17. And I would see things in the pages of Vogue like on the sort of Christian Lacroix catwalk in Paris. And I would see, you know, hint or dresses in the fancy dress box that had something of that similar vibe. And I would sort of happily wear them down to the pub on a Friday night, aged 18 in my local town of Seven Oaks, which I think oh, wow. <laughs> gave, gave everyone a bit of a shock probably. <laughs> but that's just um, what fashion is about, right? It's about having fun with it and I totally understand that. Yeah, I think I just took it very literally. I was just, <laughs> I just was like, well, if Christian Lacroix says it's okay in Paris, it must be okay in Seven Oaks. I didn't really kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's always been there. I've always loved it. Wow. So you didn't really grow up around fashion, but you always had that interest and you were always curious and also it made you kind of fearless toward being fashionable and having fun with fashion. So you go ahead and you study fashion and textile management, right? And this is really interesting because you don't hear this every day. And quite frankly, for me, it was the first time I've ever heard this. You continue to work for the Future Laboratory in London as a trend forecaster. And you did this for clients, including Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Lamborghini. What does one do as a trend forecaster? And what was that experience like? <laughs> oh God. Well, I, I always feel like a bit 
bit of a, a fraud having that in my bio because the truth is I only worked for a couple of years before I started my own brand um, yeah. and I was lucky to work for a very for a really amazing trend forecasting company called the Future Laboratory in London and they had some amazing clients and I was really lucky to work on those projects but trend forecasting is it sort of rebranded itself slightly and it's now called uh, Consumer Insight but it's you basically come up with ideas that you sell to companies so on a very big level you can be um i don't know we did one project i think it was with virgin galactic which was um, imagining space as the world's most luxurious duty-free shopping destination um <laughs> so that was yeah fascinating and then on, on other levels it can be as simple not as simple but it can be as intricate as predicting skirt length and prints and you know within fashion kind of within yeah that sort of world so I yeah I was lucky to kind of work on a variety of different projects with them the, the more artistic way of uh, describing it is which I quite like is that it's seeing the beauty and things that other people think are ugly so it's about kind of being ahead of the curve and I'm sure we've all got friends who do this in different ways I think some people do it with food some people do it with music some people do it with fashion um, it's they live slightly ahead of the rest of us and they're, they're living ahead of the curve and when you're a trend forecaster you're just doing that as, as a profession um, and you're you're sort of selling your your intuition basically yeah but it was it was a fascinating job and and I loved it and I was very very lucky Lucky to do it. As I said, for me, it was the first time I've ever heard this. I thought you need to have kind of a sense for what's about to come, right? <laughs> to forecast kind of a trend. But um, yeah, it's just a really interesting thing. Was this your first experience in the fashion industry or did you have any experience prior to becoming a designer later? Yeah, so I actually, I was a terrible university student and I started off studying um, Spanish and Portuguese. Um, in the UK, we do very specific subjects at university we don't I think I think I believe in the US you do a little bit more general de degrees I think is that right um, um I studied in <laughs> Switzerland I personally studied oh, in you? Switzerland yeah so oh, okay amazing so much more the European system yeah um, but yeah so you can do these very like specific courses so later on I did kind of textile and fashion management which is like three years studying like a very kind of specific thing but I started off doing Spanish and Portuguese I was absolutely hopeless I went out far too much I spent far too much much time partying and not enough time really any time studying and the halfway through my second year my professor said to me look you're you're gonna fail we're gonna have to kick you off the course you clearly love fashion so why don't you go over to the design department and um, see if you can get a place for next year on one of their courses and and um, thank goodness I did I, I I'd always known that I loved fashion but I was quite academic at school and my parents were very much like well, you can't draw so you can't be a designer and therefore you can't work in fashion and and actually fashion is a huge industry that requires all sorts of different people and skills but yeah they, they just looked at it in a very literal way so I then went back to the beginning started again in my first year which meant oh. I spent five years at uni and I, I had uh, I had an amazing time and I was lucky enough to be able to do internships every summer so I that was sort of my first experience of the fashion industry was I did an internship at a, a PR agency I did one in the trends team at uh, Clark's which is a British shoe brand and I sort of really tried to to do those internships and to get a better understanding of the industry that kind of real world experience and it was there that I learned about trend forecasting and that was what really kind of that was the thing I thought that was my real calling but actually then I became a designer so yeah, yeah. right um, I mean you started with trend forecasting and I believe it was I read in 2008 that you left London and you moved to Shanghai right yeah and that's right how come yeah. did you start <laughs> working as a trend forecaster then or what happened yeah, so I um, I'd been working for for Future Lab for a while, and and I was loving it. But I I met my husband, and we fell in love very young, and we were very romantic. And we decided that um, we wanted to get married, having known each other just a few months. Um, <laughs> and he was actually even younger than me. I think he was twenty three. I was twenty four. Um, and we just decided that we wanted to go on this big adventure. At the time, everyone was talking about the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and he had spent some time in China and loved it. I'd never been. And together we kind of concocted this dream that we would move to China. Um, Shanghai sounded glamorous, so I wanted to go there. <laughs> and um, oh. and yeah, we just kind of, we, we left and we got married like after a year of being together. We had our wedding and then we went off to Shanghai and I did, I carried on working in as more of a consultant out there for WGS 
GSN, which is a big trend forecasting agency, like a big global one. And then I was a sort of China correspondent for the Future Laboratory. And I, and I spent a year studying Mandarin. Wow, so you, do yeah, you speak uh, Mandarin? Oh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I can get in a taxi and, uh, you know, I can get in a taxi and explain where I want to go and I can, you know, order in a restaurant, that sort of thing. The things that matter. <laughs> the things that matter. It's, it's very well, hard. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it's uh, the toughest language, right? They say it's so hard. <laughs> this is really interesting because you leave London, you move to Shanghai, you're with your husband now, and you work as a luxury trend consultant, something like this, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Exactly. And what age are you really at this point? You are in your mid-20s, right? I'm so 25. You're... Yeah, at this point. I wish I could say I'm 25 now. Sadly not. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I was 25. So I was quite um, young, really, I suppose, to be doing this. But, but in some ways, actually, uh, getting married at that point was really incredible because it sort of was like, okay, you've done that. That's something that a lot of people spend their whole 20s and quite a lot of their 30s, you know, trying to find the person they want to spend the rest of their life with. And I think my husband and I very much had the attitude of like, right, tick, now what? You know, we just wanted yeah. to go on a big adventure together and to kind of experience the world and life. And That's beautiful. I mean, I'm the same way. My husband and I, we met when we were 19, but we got married when I was 26 then. Oh. <laughs> and we've been together every since now this year marks our 10th year in december amazing oh, congratulations yes. thank you so i you know exactly what, talking what you're about. talking about yeah. yes when i was 19 i've met him and i moved to switzerland and i was like wow. i need to be with this man and he's the man of my life so i totally understand the situation but what's also interesting oh. with you is you were already successful in the corporate world prior to becoming a designer at a young age so you already have well i i think that's probably Probably, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's very sweet of you to say so, but I was very much at the start of, of my career okay. um, in that world. And I think I was also very, very lucky because it was a time when China was on everyone's lips. There weren't that many people out there who had the sort of experience that I had had, even if it was just for a couple of years. And brands were piling into China in a big way. I was in the right place at the right time. Right. Uh, in terms of my, yeah, do, you know, doing luxury um, brand consultancy and trend forecasting out there. That was very much just, I, yeah, I think it, that was luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really, it comes down to it, right? Being at the right place at the right time. But did you get the idea or the concept for your business that you lead now in Shanghai? Or was that when you came back to Yes. Life? Yeah, yeah, no, I, it was very much a, a Shanghai thing. I knew that I wanted to to do something myself. My my father was an entrepreneur. My mother worked in the corporate world. I saw how happy my father's business made my father and how unhappy corporate life made my mother. And I very much wanted to be my own boss. And actually I wanted to start a dog food brand. That was my first idea. Looking back on it, it probably would have been quite successful. It was uh, it was a sort of you know organic dog food, very you know fashionably marketed at the time. There wasn't really anything like that available. I mean, I am so glad I didn't do it because I'm now a vegetarian, and the idea of dealing in raw meat would drive me over the edge. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, I was I was very much kind of working on the dog food idea, but at the same time, personally, I had just got completely and utterly obsessed with pajamas. I had an amazing tailor out there and he made a lot of my clothes because I'm six foot tall and I really just couldn't fit into anything that was <laughs> available in China at the time. It was before all the big, it was before, you know, H&M and Zara and all of those people had opened there. So he would, he was amazing. You could tear a page out of Vogue, give it to him and you'd have the dress the next day. It was amazing. Wow. Um, so he made a lot of my clothes and, uh, and I started just becoming really obsessed with sort of pajamas and I wore them everywhere I mean I would I wore them to my 26th birthday party all dressed <laughs> up um, which at the time I mean now of course wearing pajamas out out is you know kind of done um, I shouldn't say that <laughs> at the time it was quite groundbreaking and shocking for people and and it was it felt very exciting and I had a huge kind of order list from my friends I went back to London all my friends were obsessed with these sort of pajamas that I was wearing so I sort of diligently measured everybody's inside legs and um, went back to China with this long list of people and the guy just this, this, my sweet tailor looked at me and, and was like you I can't make 40 pairs of pajamas these take two days each to make you need a factory and it was like the slowest eureka moment ever 
I was like, oh, this is the business. <laughs> so, yeah, oh. I went off, yeah, and, and did it from there, really. So it's really because you wore your own designs, kind of, because you have yeah. a local tailor and your friends and family, they see you and do those amazing designs and they start asking you uh, to make them for them as well. And that's yeah. how it really took off for you. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah, 100 percent. And um, it took about 18 months to, to get it going. And I'm glad I took the time with it because I think the one thing I, the, the, well, a huge thing I'd learned from working with brands for the previous few years, two years, was how important branding is and how important packaging and the whole experience yeah. and the, the website and everything. And I knew very much that I needed to create that complete product from the start that it, it wasn't just about the pajamas it was about everything else that sat with them it was about the campaign it was about the packaging it was about you know even the garment labels I knew everything had to be perfect so I spent 18 months working on it and by the time it got to the point of launching it it became pretty obvious to my husband and I that this was something I wanted to do really seriously and so we decided to move back to London to run it from there because it just at the time you know yeah it was 10 years ago now and now you could easily run that luxury brand from China but in those days it was a lot harder and uh, yeah so then we moved back to London. Wow but was it in between that whole process was it ever a tough or scary decision to work maybe a stable job with a stable income to now wanting to launch your own business because you never know you never have the guarantee right that it could be a success but did you know no I'm gonna make this successful and I'm not scared I'm just gonna do this I think if I was scared absolutely I, I think I had a, a vision I had I knew that there was nothing else available like it on the market I also have a really supportive husband which <laughs> does really help and we put some of our own money into it in the beginning and there were times where I would be completely in you know floods of tears and saying oh, I'm gonna lose it all and, and he would always say look like I've backed the right horse <laughs> 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 he was like, you're going to win this race. And, and he really yeah. supported me through those early days of, of feeling like I didn't know what was going to happen. And I mean, I don't know about for you, but for me, uh, it has been a long process and the business didn't turn a profit for the first five years. And in fashion, that's very normal. So I think it's important that people are realistic about that before starting fashion brands because they are notoriously hard to make money out of. Yes. And I think for most listeners um, who will tune in to this episode I think what's important is that you know what you said you had that vision you had that mission you are very very passionate about it right mm -hmm. and I think on your way to success really it's that persistency and really being okay with not having a profitable business maybe for the first years right because I yeah. think these days as I said we see the end result right and we see everyone kind of being successful because that's what everyone shares but we don't mm -hmm. see the beginning stages the early stages stages and it can be really tough on you and maybe that's why also a lot of probably a lot of people stop what they are doing right they don't continue this journey because it is not as profitable at the very beginning yeah what, what advice would you give our listeners if you know something won't take off wide away I think you have to really hang in there and it's been quite in I mean I, I've done this now for um, 10 or 11 years and I'm always amazed almost how I think when, when you're an entrepreneur and you have big ideas or you're creative you you have an idea of something that's going to be great and you expect the rest of the world just to get it in the same way that you have and actually it can take <laughs> it can take everyone so long in some ways to sort of catch up with what you're doing or even just to get the word out there and I think yeah anyone who is starting off on this journey you just need to be prepared that it's not going to be easy it's not going to be quick and you do need to have the resources to be able to to wait and to work really really hard and now I'm really lucky I have two kids I'm pregnant with my third child like I actually I only work four days a week I've got a really good life work-life balance but for the first five or six years I mean I didn't really do anything apart from work yes. and I think you've just got to be prepared to do it all yourself to learn a huge amount to put yourself out there creatively and to be prepared that A, it might not work at all, but B, if it does work, it might take a lot longer than you expect. Thank you. That was really well said. But when did you officially launch your brand? So we launched in September 2011. 
Yeah, so we're coming up for our 10 year anniversary next September. But I suppose I was working on it for a year and a half before that, hence it being more than 10 years in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so it goes to show that you've launched already a long time ago. But, you know, I've done a lot of research prior to this conversation about fashion labels in general and starting a fashion label. And in general, you know, it's really tough for fashion labels to become successful. And and mostly because brands, they can't successfully build a customer base. What mm -hmm. advice would you give our listeners when it comes to successfully building a customer base? Maybe somebody's listening who wants to launch a jewelry brand or something else, an online business. What advice would you give them? I think nowadays, I mean, this might be quite sort of specific advice. It's not going to <laughs> help everyone. But um, in my experience nowadays, everyone is talking about D2C. And obviously that is so important. And building a strong community on social and having a really strong um, direct-to-consumer uh, retail business online is hugely important but I actually built the brand in quite a traditional way uh, when I started there was no Instagram there was no Facebook advertising or Instagram you know the, I started at a weird time where the fashion world was very much still in a traditional wholesale and PR model and I invested a lot of money in, in PR like traditional magazine PR and and also the wholesale side of the business was always really important to us and I think I've seen a huge positive from having the wholesale side of the business for us it's still a huge customer acquisition it's where so many people hear about us and I think so, nowadays so many people look at the profit margins and they talk about retail and they say well you know there's really no point doing wholesale because I only get you know x amount of the margin myself and it's barely worth doing but I would say that if you are starting out being able to build in that wholesale margin is really really good because if you can get your products into those kind of top department stores or, or, you know, or whatever you're doing, you know, if you're doing more kind of mid price fashion, getting them into Bloomingdale's or whatever, that is such a good customer acquisition. And we still ask everyone who comes into our little store in Chelsea, where did you first hear about the brand? And the number of people that will say, oh, I saw it on Netta Porta, I saw it on Selfridges. It's still huge for us. And what we sort of naughtily try and do is, of course, there are uh, those big Netta Porter and um, Selfridges and Harrods are our biggest uh, customers in some ways. We sell them a huge amount of stock, but in other ways, they're our biggest rivals. <laughs> and um, so although we very much work together with them, ultimately, we are trying to create a better brand experience for our customers, create a more personal experience. And we sort of aim to take those customers from those big stores eventually so I probably shouldn't really say that but that's what we do <laughs> yeah, but that's actually great advice you know specifically if you are able to get the customers through wholesales I mean it's part of the business right I mean they they have marketing budgets that a small brand can't even begin to comprehend exactly. so it, you're making your if you're able to forge good relationships with their marketing departments then you're able to use those budgets for your own gain basically yeah it's worked well for us for sure wow well, yeah that's really great advice actually thank you for sharing this <laughs> you know but um while transitioning kind of into becoming this luxury fashion designer have you ever failed at something while on this journey of building your business building your brand and if yes you know what have you learned from it what advice could you share with us I probably don't look at failure in the same way like when you talk about failure like nothing particularly springs to mind and that cannot be the case because I must have failed at so many things multiple times while doing this but the thing it makes me think is that I probably don't categorize failure in the same way that other people would. I think that um, for me, learning is a hugely important part of um, running the business. And I love learning. The, my favorite part of OVH and of the journey was that early, was the early years actually, because I loved all of that learning. I think it's, it's just really important to be able to not be afraid of failure, to really kind of put yourself out there And actually, pre having my first child four years ago, I think I was very controlling and very much a micromanager in some ways of my team. And I went off on maternity leave. And actually, the, from the moment I had my son, I suddenly kind of realized that actually there was more to life than my business. And I really took quite a big step back. And I sort of expected in taking that step back for my team to, for everything to sort of collapse. And actually, what happened was that. 
I came into the, I came back to the business and everything, not only did we like go into profit for the first time ever while I was away, <laughs> um, but also my team had made everything so much better and I had actually been limiting them. And before I left, I, I gave it, I gave a sort of speech to, to the company and just said, you know, I, I've never known what I'm doing and I'm not afraid of failing and I don't want any of you to be afraid of failing or making mistakes I will never hold you accountable for them but I do want you to take risks and to learn and I think that was probably really that attitude is really important of having a really kind of supportive company culture where people feel able to uh, have crazy ideas or do things differently and yeah I that's a very like strong part of our our culture at work is there really is never any blame no one ever gets cross no one ever raises their voice like all ideas are heard and actually being able to have that freedom I think is really important for people that's so nice because I always on the show you know we talk a lot about um ha being fearful or fearless or you know being afraid of failure and i always mm. say you know failure happens for you it doesn't happen against you it works in your mm. favor actually because mm -hmm. you take these little lessons here and there maybe it's a major failure maybe it's a minor failure but you take those lessons and you take them with you within your yeah. next step right and yeah. you learn from that in that moment we don't understand but you know for your future if you accept it and you don't fight against it it can be a huge propeller towards success mm, yeah 100 right? i mean if you're always succeeding you're not actually learning exactly and, <laughs> and no, no really truly successful massively successful person has never failed you know usually the biggest ideas the best ideas they stem from frustration right from yeah. um, a personal pain point and that's where you find Find a solution to a problem maybe and that's where you know you take those lessons that you learned and that's how you learn exactly just like you said yeah. and you know also while talking about you know failure back in the days I wanted to launch you know a workout program because everyone mm -hmm. did my workouts around me my family my mother my aunts my brothers yeah. and I shared it with so many people and I got criticized quite a lot and that kind of at the very beginning helped me back really and I was afraid to launch this venture so eventually I stopped doing that <laughs> and not great but um, I was really young it was my first year at university and I was um, you know because I got criticized so much I would just start doubting myself right mm -hmm. but what do you what advice would you give people on dealing with criticism in general God, I would say use it and serve it up as revenge later when you're highly <laughs> successful. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I it, for me, that was a huge driving force in wanting to make my business a success was the reactions of people around me when I told them what I wanted to do. Because I think I, I was newly married and the, the general view of my friends and family was sort of like, oh, I mean, I don't know, there was some pajamas. It all just sounded a bit bleh. And I think everyone had an idea of what it was going to be. It was going to be me sort of at little sort of Christmas fairs, selling my wares on a table. And I just thought, <laughs> actually, I'm going to show you lot. I'm, I'm going to make this the biggest luxury pajama brand in the world. I'm going to make my name synonymous with luxury pajamas and also, almost like the anger and the, you know, that sort of for me turned into like ambition and drive and the the desire to prove everyone wrong i mean now i kind of have so it's uh, it's been replaced by other things now but um but yeah in the early days that, that was a huge driving force and and i think there's nothing wrong with negative feelings just so long as you harness them in the right way i, I think you do have to be very open to criticism and yeah i think it, for me it was just about turning that into like a fire in my belly that made me want to get my revenge <laughs> so you would say use it as something that drives you that fuels you to yeah. prove people wrong because yeah. you don't do it for them right you do it for you you do it for your yeah. mission the vision that you have so really it's um about getting fueled by criticism <laughs> actually. yeah and and i think the other thing is that if you're doing something that is new and original people mm -hmm. won't have seen it before and they won't necessarily understand it and actually, when I had the idea for my brand, I kind of went out there and I talked to an awful lot of people about it. And I got such conflicting advice. And a lot of them were people who really should have known what they were talking about and did know. And they had a very strong view. And I remember coming back and just think, feeling so 
kind of pulled in a thousand different directions of what I should do about this because I couldn't possibly go ahead with this business and make them all happy and I thought okay you can't make all these people happy you just have to do something that's original something that you believe in and if you like it and you believe in it then someone else in the world will do too that you don't need to appeal to everyone and um, that's been really important part for me as well is just you is actually really like trying to stay true to your vision and and it's hard to put yourself out there creatively it's really really hard but yeah I think it's really important to just like stay true to your own vision and to stick to the path yes it's great to take on advice but ultimately like kind of ignore it <laughs> yeah thank you because that's actually something I even have uh, experience with friends who have mm -hmm. uh, launched their own businesses or opened a shop somewhere mm -hmm. and I remember one friend of mine she started a business and she um, got so confused by all the advice and mm -hmm. she said it's just too many noises and she doesn't mm -hmm. know where you know what to do but then she just did what you know she initially wanted to do the first mm -hmm. thing um, with without all the advice that she received and it uh, turned out great. So I think that's the best advice actually to stay true to yourself and to listen to yourself <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge believer in intuition and, and in listening to your gut. And I think your gut is a very different feeling to your head or your heart. And I think when it comes down to business and as women listening to our gut, Is, is hugely important like your intuition knows you know if you really like try and connect with yourself the path that you should take and I think that's really important yeah that's also really interesting because last week is what it was I went to an acupuncturist mm. and he told me so much about our gut feeling and our gut as well and I think that's in general also such an interesting topic It's great that you mentioned this. Right. So I'm a firm believer that success, it always, you know, it stems from forming an alliance with people who have the best interest for your company, right? And they're, mm. their craft, the best. How do you, you know, personally select a great team? What do you look for in people who you want to hire or who want to work for you? I, I think I've been so lucky with my team. I don't have a big team at all. There's only... I think 16 or 17 people now in head office. And a lot of them have, have been there for a very, very long time. Yeah, I mean, some people have been there since the beginning. We don't really tend to lose people, I think, in the whole time I've done the business, maybe lost like five people. So we have a very low turnover of staff. And I think when it comes down to employing people, It's the same way that I do everything, which is what I was just talking about, is about actually following my gut instinct. Like obviously, in the beginning, it's about looking at CVs. and um, but, but when it really comes down to it, I, I do think a lot about, like, would this person kind of, I suppose, fit in with the company culture? Would they, would they be fun at the Christmas party? Um, I just, that's a sort of silly thing to say, but... Yeah, so you, see, you look at them, you know, also on a just personal level. It's not yeah. just how, what does their CV say. You just look at them and also listen to your gut feeling about them as a whole person, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, the OVH is, is quite a special environment because everyone gets on so well and we are like a little kind of family and everyone's a sort of actually quite a similar age and they, they all go out together after work I mean oh, not now with COVID but <laughs> um but you know it's very sociable and for most people that have been there the majority of their experience in the working world has been at OVH so we're all learning together and yeah as I mean we don't have any investors the wow. business has grown completely organically so I mean I couldn't afford to hire who I wanted so I very much hired people who who I just really liked and who I could really imagine at the company and everyone is really amazing at kind of coming together and pushing it forward in the right direction it's very much a team effort Wow. You know, this um, very harmonic and very positive culture in your company, how did you establish it? Was it only through really hiring the right kind of people? Or is there also something additional? Do you do something within the company <laughs> that this um, culture, you know, continues? I don't know how you're going to feel about my answer to this, but the absolute truth, it's probably very, like a very, probably very British thing. But when things are getting a little tough or people are having a hard time um, or there's any kind of conflict, we tend to all just go to the pub and get really, really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. That's exactly what I would love, you know, if 
my team is, you know, on the edge of things and we just need to let loose. I mean, I love this. Actually. This is amazing. Well, we all just have a great time together. And actually often, I mean, it's not as obvious as that. I'll sort of be like, okay, let's finish work early. Let's, let's go and have lunch and get some wine. And then, you know, and actually you'll often sort of see the two people who have been having a problem kind of three hours in looking rather pissed kind of in the corner having some deep and meaningful chat about what's happened and I'm actually a big believer in that and I mean I don't know how long we can keep going with that sort of culture because obviously it's very different when you're a very small team and we don't have investors and we're not answerable to anyone and everyone's young and everyone drinks and goodness knows it will change very soon but um for now that's my very unprofessional way of dealing with things <laughs> But it's actually really refreshing and it's also something that as long as it works as you say it's perfect it's just really important to have fun and we have an amazing christmas party that we always have every year that we can't have this year that we're completely devastated about i don't know if there's like a big theater if there's like a new play in town we take everyone to go and see that or we just kind of do quite a lot of fun stuff together and I think that keeps us great friends as well as colleagues and it just makes life more interesting and fun right yeah right that's nice actually but when was kind of like the breakthrough moment was it really when you just mentioned you know it was when I left because I was pregnant yeah. is there a specific moment that defined the future of your brand was that the moment or is there a kind of a moment that defined the future of your brand there have been like a few kind of like key sort of pivotal moments I, I suppose after 18 months that was the first one that was our, our first sort of experience of the celebrity kind of touch was that David Beckham was spotted by someone that got leaked to the press of him shopping for Christmas presents for Victoria and it was a very slow news day and um, the whole story, it was sort of just before Christmas and the whole story was like, what do you buy the woman who has everything? And the answer was these kind of crazily expensive silk pajamas. It just got syndicated and it was on, ev it was in every single newspaper. It went over to the US and it was suddenly, my parents who had never taken what I did seriously at all, there's a rather serious uh, BBC radio channel here, Radio 4, that all the sort of older generation listen to it, and they suddenly heard my name being uttered on the radio. And my parents for the first time were like oh right okay you're actually doing something interesting and and that was definitely a pivotal moment um because suddenly having that level of attention i just remember looking at the traffic to our website kind of you know went up like a hundred times that day and uh, well more than that it was just a kind of crazy thing and then it went from being very much you know my little baby um that i was sort of completely in in control of and very much working on every aspect of to becoming a much more professional company since i had my first son for sure that's kind of changed everyone's responsibility i suppose within the company everyone really stepped up and has carried on being amazing so yeah that that was a big change as well well, that's quite something if you, you know, have celebrities or influencers who, uh, you know, wear your brand. Those are the people who everyone else kind of also looks up to. So whatever they do, <laughs> you want to have it, you want to be it. So I guess that's <laughs> obviously great marketing itself, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But what is, what is your favorite, because you're a woman in the fashion industry, what is your favorite aspect of being a female entrepreneur? I suppose within my industry, most of us are women so I, I do quite enjoy meeting sort of pompous old men and they sort of turn to me at dinner and say oh what does your husband do and I say he works for me <laughs> <laughs> that's um, really owning it yes so that's always quite fun I mean he doesn't actually work for me at all we own the business together and, and we run it together but um but yes he I I did do it for five years before him so I do feel legitimate in saying he works for me plus I'm the CEO um <laughs> but yeah I I, I don't know if for me being a female ha has really defined my journey just because of probably the industry I'm in. It's very normal. It's it's not like I'm a, you know, if I was in, I don't know, fintech or something, it would probably be a, <laughs> been a very different story. But for me, it's, it's very normal for, to be a woman in fashion. Yeah. For me, it's really important, the uh, primarily female listeners of our podcast is mm. that we see more, more women 
in higher places, you know, of being course. the CEOs of companies, getting questions like, oh, and what does your husband do? It's horrible. Yeah. It's sexist. It's not okay, you yeah. know, getting these questions. And <laughs> it's actually the best response. I will remember this response. <laughs> it works for me. I will tell those people, <laughs> you know, because everything, maybe just like uh, your story, we've built together. There is no mm-hmm. imbalance. There is no, I live off my husband. So I think, you know, for the girls who are listening, listening to this, you can be a CEO, you can be a mother, you can be a wife, you know, you can do it. Many times we read or we hear people say, oh, you can't have it all. You can't do this. You, you should do this and that. And I think really important that you just do whatever suits you and what you want mm-hmm. to do. And mm-hmm. it's not a gender thing, actually. And that's why I ask you, you know, what mm-hmm. is your favorite aspect? Because, um, you know, you are a CEO. And that's really an amazing achievement itself. I mean, I, I definitely have experienced, um, no, I mean, now I'm talking, now I'm thinking about it. I, I can think of numerous occasions. Uh, most recently, um, going to see a new lawyer with my husband, um, who was very much someone who I had chosen, I had um, wanted to uh, work with. And, um, and we went to see him. And honestly, this man could not look at me. I mean, he directed every single question to my husband, even though my husband didn't have a clue what we were meant to be talking about. And I would sort of answer and then, and he was sort of, and then he would talk straight back to my husband. And I mean, I, I got a huge kick out of emailing him afterwards and saying, I, I'm so sorry. I, I don't want to work with you because, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I absolutely understand this because, you know, for me, I was first in tech. I received a partnership with the NHL and Mm -hmm. I was the first woman in a startup like that to get a partnership with no investors, right? Mm -hmm. I just got it because it was really multi-beneficial. It it turned everyone's head kind of around. They were like, did you do it by yourself? I was like, of course. Mm -hmm. I called the CEO. We had a nice chat. Um, Later, you know, my little brother, he is a professional soccer player um i you know when it was about his contract negotiations Mm -hmm. i went with him he didn't have an agent and they asked him who's your agent he said my sister (laughs) and they could not (laughs) believe and the things i've heard you know in that room were so horrible here i am i i have my own business i helped my brother get this contract right and they expected a man and they were horrified when they saw me and um, me going into that meeting knowing what we wanted what the contract is going to be like they were you know in shock I think so I think Mm -hmm. it's, it's still for women I think it's always that we need to prove that you know, we need to earn that kind of a respect. While when you're a man, you are just going into the room. And Mm -hmm. if you have some one or two achievements, you know, you have that respect for no reason. (laughs) And I think yeah and i think for women we need to prove it and show them uh no i have a seat at the table and um i'm here because i deserve to be here just like you deserve to be here and i think that's why we called the show also bossy and glossy because you know bossy has always this negative connotation right yes only exactly and Mm -hmm. i thought you know for years and years and years we could not stop people using that word for a woman who does the exact same thing amen does assertive woman basically Basically. Yeah. yeah. So You'd never call an assertive man bossy, would you? You just call them assertive or powerful. <laughs> exactly. And if a man leads and he makes decisions, he's the boss. You know, he has to do these mm-hmm. things because you know, otherwise he wouldn't be successful. As soon yeah. as the woman does it, it's bossy, right? Yeah. And so I thought, listen, we're gonna use this word for something positive. We uplift yeah. each other. We help each other. This this is a community of incredibly young, talented women, mm-hmm. and they want to become something they want to work for what they are doing and we are using it as something positive and so when you call me bossy exactly Mm -hmm. and so if you call me bossy thank you it's a great thing it's it's positive (laughs) exactly and that's why we call it this way also yeah and I think it's really important that the conversation has changed so much in recent years um, especially with the me too movement and actually it's really important if you are in a position of power if for instance if you have gone into a meeting as a CEO of a company and you find that people are not behaving the way that you would wish them to behave you know if they're I don't know a client or well probably not their client you're their client then you can say excuse me please can you redirect these questions to me and not to my husband because 
I am the one who called this meeting. And if everyone actually spoke out more, then these things simply wouldn't happen. I'm sure that that man was very embarrassed by what he did, and I'm sure he will never do it again <laughs> after I said I that. Think, <laughs> yeah, it's important to put them in their place. Sometimes, you know, people, they try and they look how much they can do it, or they're just yeah. ignorant, right? They're just yeah. ignorant. And, and it's I very think, hard, because of course yeah. you can only do it if you're in the position of power yourself, and the trouble is, is that that's rare, and yeah. Exactly, that's why we have these conversations to make the girls who are listening to the show to really go for the life that they want and to be the boss of their um, own life and change the narrative of being, Mm -hmm. um, you know, a CEO, you know, but on a more personal note, you know, you're a mother of two, you're married Mm -hmm. and now it's a third child is actually on its way. (laughs) What (laughs) What is that actually like while being a businesswoman? It has been very different this year up until COVID struck people would say to me, how do you make it work? And I would say, well, you know, I have a lot of help and I do. I have a full-time nanny. I have a cleaner. Um, I'm very supported in the home, which means that I don't have to worry about doing the washing and the ironing. And I can, when I'm at home, just enjoy being with my children. Then of course, COVID happened. And weirdly, my wish for this year was I wanted to spend more time with my children. And I was actually going to take a four month sabbatical and be with because my little one started school in September and I just thought it was a really magical time I really don't you know I don't want him to have gone to school and for me not to have really had some proper time with him because I, I did go back to work after a couple of months and uh, and actually in the weirdest way my <laughs> sort of wish came true in the most ghastly roundabout way and uh, my nanny was pregnant so she left in March and we didn't see her again till September and my cleaner left and suddenly um i found myself very much the mother and doing all of that stuff and uh, and actually um initially it was completely exhausting my husband thank god you know we work on the business together so we were able to say right you do the morning shift at work i'll look after the kids and we'll swap at lunch and we did that for five months <laughs> i really don't know how it was incredibly hard work But as a family, it made us so close. And in the UK now, we're under another lockdown. We're not allowed to go into the office. So actually, I've spent a huge amount of time at home with my children. And it's been amazing. And I think childhood goes incredibly quickly. And I'm really glad that I've been able to have that time with them. Because suddenly, by the time they go to school, they're living, you know, they have their own little lives and they go off to their friends' houses for playdates and you know, you're not kind of with them all the time. They're off at school. Um, so I'm I'm really glad to have had that. Yeah. You know, that time when they're at this age, you will never get it back. So, no. you know, it's kind of like a blessing in disguise that you are able to stay home now, even though the situation is not maybe the situation you thought <laughs> that is no. <laughs> so it, actually no one thought this is going to be 2020 but oh, uh, God. Yeah, what so, a year eh yeah <laughs> and it's almost <laughs> over I cannot believe thank uh, God this has been insane but just like you said even for us it slowed us down but in the best way possible actually mm. we use this time and it really has helped maybe a lot of people also to find mm. the time to spend it with their loved ones more so than usual and I think it's a beautiful thing actually mm. Yeah, I think I'm thinking about like more practical advice for kind of people who are at an earlier stage in their business. I'm obviously lucky that now I, I do have a really good team who are able to run things in my absence. and I don't have to be there, you know, every hour of every day in the same way I was before. But thinking back to the early days, one of the easiest, one of the best things was that my office was only a five minute walk away from my home. And if that's something that you're able to do when you have young children, that makes a massive difference because it meant that when I had a very young baby, I was able to just like, you know, take him for a little walk and then pop into the office and kind of chat to my team for half an hour and then go home to feed him. And it was just having that work-life balance, actually having the home and office so close did make a huge difference to my life at that point. Yeah, that's actually great advice. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I guess, especially during times like these, right? On days where you don't feel like too motivated, is there something that really drives you and you can just kick off and um, motivate yourself? Uh, Yes. And it is looking at my competitors' websites and Instagram accounts. (laughs) That's so interesting. (laughs) 
um, when I need a real kick, oh. you know, when I really need to kind of kick myself and get get myself into gear, if I'm being a bit sluggish, then yeah, having a look at my the my competitors always makes me very kind of uh, fired up, and I charge off into work. Yes, with lots of things. So it, uh, we have a lot. We have a bit of a problem with people uh, copying what we do, and I think it drives me to be better. Yeah, so that's always a good <laughs> motivator for me. I feel like my motivators are very dark. Talking to you, <laughs> like so I, 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 and... <laughs> I understand this because it really drives me as well. I always look at um, my competitors actually, and it drives mm. me. One of my idols is Whitney Wolf from Bumble. Mm. And she, mm. When I see her interviews and what she has achieved in such a short amount mm. of time, and it was usually when I injured my own app, that was who I was looking at all the time. It would fuel me up. It would fire me up. And yeah. I totally understand this. I mean, I love podcasts myself. I listen to them yeah. myself. So when I see other people talking about a topic that's interesting, it fires me up. I want to talk about it as well. <laughs> so yeah. I totally understand you. And it's, a, it's, I think, a healthy competition kind of, right? A healthy way also to get motivated to look at yeah. you know I think what would be unhealthy is if you are jealous what is somebody else doing but it's not the case you look at them and it fires you up it motivates you to do better with your yeah. right with your day yeah so that's actually a, a good thing I do think that sometimes there is this perception that women who are successful are like getting up at 4 30 every morning and doing amazing <laughs> like workout and then they're like optimizing their time by journaling and like you know kind of I don't know meditating and then eating a really healthy breakfast with a smoothie and it's like that is that is not the way I live my life I mean I sleep for as much as I possibly can I really do think sometimes I just have to have a bed day and like that's okay and like there are days where sometimes I just think I'm I'm so exhausted I don't have it in me today and yeah I go back to bed and I spend the day in bed and I watch Netflix and it revives me and it resuscitates me and of course if you're doing that every day that is not going to be helpful but if it is like a once in an every now and again like give yourself a break don't have a workout eat something unhealthy and spend the day in bed that's fine that reminds me exactly of um i think it was jk rowling she you know there was an article on twitter that was i think from business insider or the time <laughs> something oh, yeah. like this and she the headline was to be successful the most successful people wake up at 4 30 a.m and she oh. replied with oh please f off <laughs> <laughs> and it became it became this whole thing and everyone liked her tweet and i mean she's this successful successful person she has done all the harry potter books and yeah. you know you read something like this and you think oh my god maybe that's why i'm not that successful i don't wake up at 4 30 do three workouts meditate do this and that you know that might be one person or two people who do these things you know yeah. who are successful but everyone obviously kind of create the day they want to create <laughs> and be Definitely. creative with their whole entire routine in order to be successful you don't have to have the same routine Gates has right, no, <laughs> so. and, and I actually think it's quite dangerous. I, I think, as women, there is this big conversation at the moment about sort of like life optimization this feeling of having to cram every single minute full. And okay. actually, for, for me, I find some of my best ideas come when I'm just sitting vacantly staring out of a window. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't. I think it's important to give yourself the time to feel a bit bored or just wander around or I think it's dangerous to feel that we absolutely must cram every moment full. I would end up feeling very disappointed with myself if I saw my day sort of journaled out and written down. I think I would feel very disappointed by what I'd achieved in some ways because some days I have amazing days where I just boom, 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 I get everything done everything's easy it all comes to me in a flash I have a fantastic day other days I, I do absolutely nothing and I have a hopeless day and it's okay to that's human and that's okay you, you can't you know you have to make the most of how you're feeling at a certain point and your environment around you it all it all impacts you hugely no it is yeah. actually so accurate for what's happening right now but on a more lighter note I scrolled obviously through everything you have created on your website I cannot get enough, <laughs> you know, season, there are new collections, spring, summer, fall, winter. How do you actually get into the creative mode and come up with new ideas? What does that creative process look like? 
Um, well, I've had an amazing designer that I work with called Fran and we've worked together for six years. She's my design director and these days she does a huge amount of the design process. We kind of have a conversation at the start of every season where we talk about the things that are inspiring us um, and that could be anything. I mean, it, sometimes it's a line from a book or it's, I don't know, a painting we've seen or a landscape. It really can be anything. I think we've become very in tune with each other creatively. And then Fran is an amazing researcher and she will go off and spend three or four days in the library and she'll go and she kind of just goes off into this like land of old books and old magazines and she'll she'll go down some kind of amazing creative sort of tunnel and go on this amazing discovery and and she comes out at the end of it with a beautiful mood board and then from that we take the color palette and we get all of the print inspiration from there and although i am involved in the process um it really is coming from her these days so yeah <laughs> and for your current collection what was the mm -hmm. inspiration behind it what does the current collection look like for those who are listening um so the current collection it's uh, it is christmas and it is god i always find it really hard talking about the current collection because we're now working on next christmas and i've already done three seasons between <laughs> Oh, so you have to wait. This is now really interesting. So you are already doing next Christmas. Next yeah, yeah. Christmas. Wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're like, yeah, we're doing the print design for next Christmas now. So for us, by the time it hits the stores, it's like, wow, it feels like ages ago because it was what we were working on this time last year. But at the moment, I think it's the Silver Screen Dream collection. So it's all inspired by kind of like old Hollywood and that sort of notion of beautiful, old fashioned. Um, glamour and we became really obsessed with this amazing actress called Anna Mae Wong and she was the first Chinese American Hollywood star who actually was very under recognized for her acting and for her amazing achievements and so we sort of did a collection that was celebrating her style and basically we are making you know silk and <laughs> silk some silk pajamas and beautiful yeah. prints Yeah. And then we also do lots of like beautiful embellishments. We do lots of kind of heavily embellished velvets and it's a beautiful collection. I'm glad you like it. Yes. I mean, I've, <laughs> I saw particular one kimono. It's a short kimono with a floral print, really beautiful. And that's kind of something you shaped, right? You've kind of shaped an entire movement of wearing those things outside, right? <laughs> so yeah. that's that a kimono i would exactly wear like the model on the website right with hoop earrings with heels how do you shape an entire trend like this is it because you yourself wear it like this and people see it on you or recently it was even like hayley bieber and this whole silk pajama ensemble with some air force ones and a um yeah. you know i think it was just a a cross body bag something like this it looks super cool you dress these things up with earrings and heels and it looks so elegant and obviously you have shaped kind of this trend right well i think we've been a part of the trend and yes we were definitely one of the first brands that was that was doing that but i think it, it's something that would have happened anyway Tr trends are very interesting and the way that they work and the way they move i, I sort of imagine it to be almost like a pendulum so um, well, there's so many different things that influence kind of how a trend happens. But when I started doing silk pajamas, it was coming off the back of a decade of, so it was, I started in 2010, I've had the idea. And that was at the end of the noughties. And we, the whole thing then had been like Hervé Leger bandage dresses and super high Christian Louboutin five inch heels <laughs> and everything was like very tight and very revealing and very uncomfortable so then everyone sort of adopts that and everyone is dressing like that and then suddenly it gets to the point where even your own mother is dressing like that and then suddenly all the cool people don't want to look like that anymore and the pendulum swings and then you go in completely the opposite direction and kind of the opposite to a really tight a villager bandage dress is a pair of pajamas because it's very modest it's very loose it's quite masculine But it also has this sort of feeling of kind of like old fashioned sort of decadence and looseness about it. And I think the whole of um, then the following decade that we've been in 2010 to 2020 has been about this much more kind of like exploring this much more like comfortable, comfortable clothes. And I mean, God, that has really reached its zenith in 2020. Like, I mean, has anyone worn anything that doesn't have an elasticated waistband um, this year? <laughs> 
And so, and so because of that, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the pendulum now swings again in the next decade and people start getting into really structured, uncomfortable clothes again. Oh, I don't know, maybe maybe people won't be able to go back from this. I'm not sure, but it has, COVID's obviously had a huge impact on how people dress. In terms of the pyjama trend, it started off with pyjamas and people kind of wearing pyjamas to, to parties, like wearing beautiful silk pyjamas, uh, almost in the same way that a man would kind of wear a suit to like a black tie uh, cocktail party or something. And then that kind of has then spread throughout slip dresses and kimonos and um, yeah, and it, it's been really cool to be a part of that, but I'm sure it's a trend that would have happened without us. We were just probably one of the brands that was doing it in a big way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love it. I In the summertime, nothing beats a beautiful slip silk dress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's the most beautiful and chic and elegant and effortless thing to mm -hmm. wear actually. And it's mm -hmm. you can wear it with heels or just with flats and it will always yeah. look kind of perfect with no yeah. you know big effort that you put into it. What is it like seeing people actually wearing your design? It, it's kind of strange in some ways. I think I find it quite hard to get my head around, especially if it is a very big celebrity. I, I sort of slightly kind of go a bit blank and just kind of turn the page. <laughs> I, I, I don't really, um, it, obviously it's hugely exciting, but it, it sort of slightly throws me as well because I would find it much more exciting if, if, if it was happening to somebody else. Um, then, then I would sort of be like, wow, God, that's so amazing. I can't believe, you know, that Beyonce is wearing your dress. Wow, can you even believe it? When it's me, I'm kind of like, oh, right, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> I guess it feels amazing. It's maybe overwhelming or it's just, you know, maybe that moment where, you know, you've worked so hard toward this and seeing actually the end result, people actually were, you know, famous people, which, you know, you saw in the introduction that I made, all these celebrities wearing your designs. I think it's just an amazing thing. And it's, it truly shows how everything you said from the beginning, you want to give a customer that feeling. It's not just they bought something but you look at the packaging all these things and at the end of the day you see i don't know jayla wearing your launchwear it's really the whole process the whole marketing everything from persistency and learning things you maybe have taken on from being a trend forecaster before and later you know going along this journey and learning and implementing things and being innovative i think that's the best results seeing all of these people wearing your designs and people who are also highly successful wearing your designs i think it's an amazing thing actually thank you i think <laughs> the thing it gives me real pleasure when i see people re-wearing things because i think with celebrities they, they get given so many clothes and they could wear something different every day if they liked when you see someone re-wearing something then and that's happened quite a bit j-lo wears our tracksuits the whole time she lives in them and <laughs> right. and that gives me a huge pleasure because then I know that we've created something that has a real purpose for someone in their wardrobe. And to me, that's the product that's really successful because it, it has a place in someone's life. And the only reason that I see that that's being worn all the time is because it's J-Lo. But the fact that it's J-Lo is sort of rather neither here nor there, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Obviously, I love her like everyone does. I suppose it's just that you know you've really succeeded with the product when you see a celebrity re-wearing it because she yeah. could wear a different tracksuit every day of the week. And the fact is that she keeps right. on coming back to yours and choosing yours. And so that's sort of to me is like that's a, an, a marker of success I suppose I feel like okay I've actually created something that that is really useful to someone and really serves a purpose <laughs> I mean now obviously for that you have to have a beautiful design and beautiful quality right these days we see so many products you know clothing and pajamas being wasted mm -hmm. after just a few months of wearing them because you just can't we wear them after there's a hole in them or the quality is bad and mm -hmm. they might look look gorgeous on you they might look amazing on you but the quality is just not there you always sell 100 sell really great material as well do you always check and know these are the materials that we will use you will always ensure that it's high quality products oh god yeah and i think um that's a hugely important part to me that's the real meaning of luxury Mm -hmm. It's like actually using the best quality products and also products that you know have like, you know, a good impact. Well, good might be pushing it because of course fashion is hugely damaging to the environment, sadly, but it's, it's very important for us that the products that we make are as sustainable as possible. I think things that are beautiful quality 
I would say it's better to buy once and buy well than to buy, you know, we often get messages from people on Instagram saying like, oh, I see that you're making pajamas and Victoria's Secret make pajamas and theirs cost a hundred dollars and yours cost 500. And what's the difference? Like it's like, yeah. well, for a start, Victoria's Secret's pajamas are made out of plastic mm -hmm. and they will be here forever. And that is really scary when you look at all of the things in your wardrobe that are made from polyester and there's, everyone has a huge amount of them, sadly. And the idea that those clothes will outlast all of us, I find that really frightening. And it's one of the things I'm really proud of with OVH is that 99.9% .9 of what we create will return to the earth. We really, really avoid using plastic in any way, shape or form to the point where we designed this beautiful dress and it had pearls all over the sleeves and everyone said, well, of course, we use plastic pearls. And I said, I'm not using plastic. <laughs> and so we put real pearls on, which was so expensive and ridiculous. But it's that's how important it is to me. It goes, it's more important than profit margins. It's well, that's important. so incredible because that's an important impact. You know, being a fashion designer, it comes with a responsibility. Even mm -hmm. if you are not a fashion designer, but you launch your own business, it always comes with a responsibility. And mm -hmm. specifically in fashion, as you said, being responsible, having a positive impact for our earth mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. as sustainable as you can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, for starters, polyester, I cannot even wear it because it stinks. You know, after mm -hmm. you wear it, it's kind of not breathable mm -hmm. and I cannot wear it. So it's really important that you understand also as a buyer, as we love fashion, as we are maybe fashionable people who are listening to the podcast, that we really are conscious about our purchases. And yeah. I think that's actually really amazing what you're doing with being as sustainable and responsible with producing your products. I really think that's incredible. I think it's completely essential for any fashion designer, in fact, anyone doing any sort of business today. Like I think sustainability needs to be at the absolute kind of core of what you're doing because it is just such a hugely important thing that we all need to think about moving forward. And if you are establishing a business now, making sustainability at the absolute heart of it, your, your life is going to be made so much easier moving forward because it's hard to do retrospectively. You know, when I was in a tech industry, a lot of these tech giants, they were apologizing, you know, for social media bullying, for example, that they mm -hmm. never started their business at the core of, you know, building a kind or a good community with robust reporting, let's say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something to be avoided. If you start your business from the very beginning with a clear mission and vision to really make the world, let's say, a better place, right? And not just build a business only for profit, only become successful but also you know creating something more than that mm -hmm. I think that's so essential mm -hmm. and so that's why I really like your approach as well to think you know from the very beginning to implement this conscious and a sustainable brand rather mm -hmm. than at the end say oh we are so sorry you know now we want to maybe you know mm -hmm. do a little impact here and there um, mm -hmm. I think that's really really essential yeah 100% so lastly I mean this has been going so fast um, but lastly we always do this at the end of the show dead or alive who would you love to invite for dinner it doesn't matter if the person is alive or not who would you once want to have over for dinner I would choose the queen the I queen wow yes. why how come <laughs> I I really admire her yeah I think she's absolutely incredible she has lived a life of complete service to our country to my country i think she has lived through so many different decades and i think she just must have had the most extraordinary life and i would be so interested to meet her especially because she's really old now and yeah <laughs> wow, that's so cool i didn't even expect this answer i thought maybe coco chanel somebody <laughs> like this because you're a designer but this is a this is actually an incredible answer thank you so much <laughs> well, thank you in general. Thank you so much for your time today, for being open with us and sharing all this value and insights. We hope to see you maybe soon again, one day on the oh, show. And thank you so much for having me. I've really loved chatting to you. It's likewise. been great. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. 
bossies. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being part of this incredible conversation, Olivia Van Halle. And make sure you tune in next week. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and make sure to follow us at Bossy Podcast on Instagram. Make sure you do that and don't miss out on any future episodes and guests that we will have on this month and next month. So until next week, Bossy Gang, bye.